What's up? It's episode 127, Pain Points of Wealth, and the economic data just keeps coming in better than better. We literally had inflation dropping faster than anyone anticipated. We had the start of banking season, bank earnings came out, the start of the earnings season, and they came in better than expected. The numbers look good, employment is strong. We're gonna talk about what pitfalls may lie ahead in the economy, what you have to watch out for, the mistakes you might be making that you need to adjust given where the economy is. And we're gonna talk about paralysis by analysis. There's a lot of things stopping you for making the right financial decision to be on your path to financial independence. Check it out. We got a phenomenal show. Hey, if you need any more proof of why investing is so hard, you know, the news hasn't gotten all that much better, but the market is approaching an all-time record high while people are still waiting for someone to wave, wave the flag, you know, hit the horn, tell us, it's all clear. You know, why is the market going up? How did I miss it? Well, you know what, Dad? Ryan always talks about how he doesn't have a crystal ball, but I actually think Ryan does have a crystal ball because I was listening to one of our old podcast episodes, I think from uh, last year, where we talked about how higher, higher interest rates would have a good impact on the banks. And fast forward to this year, banks had great earnings. So I don't know, maybe your crystal ball is not as broken as you think. Well, I keep it really simple. Not only do I listen to our podcast, but I listen to Courtney Garcia, uh, financial advisor, Payne Capital Management uh, on CNBC every week, who happens to be on the show today. Great to have you with us today, Court. Um, and you know what? That's where I get all my financial advice. And, you know, Court, you know, you obviously you're dealing with a lot of clients. You're talking on TV every single week. And, you know, what are the biggest concerns? Because I feel like we're still climbing this wall of worry. It's like, well, the market's up, economy's doing better. But, you know, what are those buts out there uh, that are stopping people from getting invested and what are the naysayers are saying? I think the biggest thing is people are listening to the news and there's still plenty of negative Nancy's out there. And they're really forecasting this recession, which people have been calling for for a year and a half now. They're saying it's eventually going to happen. It's eventually going to happen. But there looks like less and less of a chance that a recession is actually going to happen. So everybody's waiting for the second shoe to drop and they don't want to be invested. Meanwhile, you have missed a huge upswing since middle of October. And to Bob's point, we are getting closer to our highs, but markets are not back to their highs yet. So you want to make sure you stay invested because usually when people are worried, it's that wall of worry that you mentioned, it's usually the best time to be invested. That's when the upswing is going to happen. It's not when there's been some sort of all clear signal or everybody is euphoric about the markets. You've probably missed the rally at that point. So you don't want to wait for that all clear. It's not going to happen. You need to make sure you're invested in the meantime. Everybody we compete with, right? We see how many, I don't know, how many proposals we do a month, 30 or 40 or 50. Uh, we're looking at all these competitors and they show every one of their potential clients or existing clients that there's all these different asset classes that, that, you know, some are at the top at uh, each year and some are at the bottom. And then you look at the portfolio and they own large cap growth stocks. I mean, well, they don't believe in diversification. They sell it and then they invest their clients in one asset class. Well, to be fair, Chris just said, I just put all my money in NVIDIA and I have no problems. I'll just put in NVIDIA and I can go away for about 10 years and I'll be fine. Is that, is that the right decision right now? Well, I was just kind of hoping AI would run our portfolio for us. So, you know, I thought that might be a good bet. <laughs> hey, we no, just had a media hit with a guy who claimed he was not invested in the market because he didn't like the current administration. And it turns out he had all his money in NVIDIA for the last two years. Yeah, right. It's like, it's like I love to tell you what I bought in the past because I already know it went up. Um, but no one tells you what to invest in the future. That's the problem. And I think that's the biggest problem right now is what you're seeing is, is tech has had this magnificent move. In fact, the NASDAQ 100 10 stocks make up 60% of that index. 10 stocks, the capitalization of it are 10 stocks, not the 100 stocks that are in there. And the S&P 500, you have eight stocks that account for 30% of it. So I think your big risk here is we know where money goes. Hot money goes into what's been working lately. So if you're buying the NASDAQ, you're buying any of those technology stocks, you're buying the S&P 500, that could be a big mistake right now. Well, it's always been a big mistake, guys. I don't know if you ever heard of the Nifty 50 back in the 60s and 70s. There were 50 stocks that everybody put every dime into. I mean, you had these really hot companies like Pepsi and McDonald's um, that were selling at these gigantic multiples. Nobody saw any opportunity anywhere else. Those stocks had to perform for 20 years uh, while money managers piled money into the same old names. So I have to believe it's kind of the same thing now. 
Bob, I think a lot of people don't realize that they may be invested that way also. So you may have a bunch of different mutual funds or a bunch of different exchange traded funds that all have different names to them. Like maybe you have an all a total stock market fund and a large cap growth fund, an SP 500 fund. You don't realize they're all invested in pretty much the same things. And those eight stocks that have been leading this rally so far and are taking up a majority of those indexes are taking up a majority of people's funds right now. And they have no idea they come to us and have 50, 60% in large cap growth and have never looked at it before. And especially yeah, if we've been into the last 10 years, it's been doing well, which is great, but it's growing as more and more of your portfolio. So it's good to take a look underneath the hood, see what you're invested in, because this could be a good time to get re-diversified here. There's plenty of opportunities. Yeah, that's so true, Courtney. I actually uh, did a proposal for a prospective client a few weeks ago, and he has a little bit of Apple stock and all these different funds that you mentioned. He's like, well, I still want to keep a little bit of my Apple stock. And we actually went through... <laughs> And looked at all those funds, and it turned out like forty percent of his portfolio was an Apple, mm -hmm. because of uh, you know because of having all those different funds had the exact same thing. Well, it's crazy well, if you own Berkshire Hathaway now. Um, I mean, forty uh, the numbers are like something like forty percent of the entire capitalization is Apple stock and cash. You know, <laughs> so I was like, well, I own this conglomerate of all these businesses. You kind of don't, right? So it's like it's kind of hidden everywhere. Uh, tech in your portfolio, and you've got to diversify that risk because you know we have an old saying. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Well, you know, you take last year where, you know, growth got slaughtered um, and you didn't even have a dividend to make you feel okay while it was going down and there's no cash flow to take advantage of why things are in sale. That's why, you know, diversification makes so much sense. You know, not just to own other companies, but to own dividend flow, cash flow, um, you know, from, you know, real estate investment trusts that pay almost four and a half percent, you know, pipelines that are yielding close to six percent, international stocks. They're yielding 4%. As that cash flow comes up, you're getting to buy shares. I mean, when something's down, the best time to buy it is when it's down to get more shares so that you can benefit when it goes up. So you're saying, Bob, buy low, sell high? Write that down. Buy low, hold forever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dad, I think you were telling me the other day that you're getting a little bit disappointed with your cash flow that you're getting from the business. I, I, you should probably talk to your partner about that. You know, like I always say, he, you know, he works me like a dog, but he pays me like a puppy. That's called everything's right with the world. But, you know, another thing, too, that I'm hearing right now a lot is, you know, when we say we talk about this pretty much every week and Bob loves to say, you know, it's OK to be wrong, not OK to stay wrong. But these strategists and economists, they just keep pushing out their wrong view. And, Court, I'm sure you're seeing this on TV a lot where it's like, well, you know, we're not in the recession yet. Even I told you it would be. But wait till the end of the year. Right. The recession is going to come then because the Fed's not going to lighten up on interest rates. They're going to in fact, they're going to tighten even further. And, you know, what are you hearing, Courtney? But I feel like it's like, this is a wrong opinion. It's been wrong. Why can't you change your opinion? Yeah, that's what drives me crazy about this is people have been calling for it for a year and a half. And yeah, now they're pushing it off another six months or a year. If you call for something long enough, it will eventually happen. I mean, a recession is a very normal part of the cycle of the economy. <laughs> True. So yes, if you call for it years and years and years, eventually you'll be right. It doesn't make you right in the meantime. But there's been so much that people have been expecting. They thought that earnings were going to fall off a cliff. They haven't. They thought that the Fed was going to continue raising interest rates. They finally paused for the first time. It looks like we're finally, hopefully, getting to an end of that here soon. Unemployment has remained very resilient. The labor market is very strong. And ultimately, if we have a strong consumer, which we're having because of the strong labor market, that's going to keep the economy going. And a lot of these things are much more leading to a a strong economy than us going into recession. And that's exactly what we're staying invested for is the markets continue in this upwards direction. You do not want to miss out on that momentum because you could miss on that out on that forever. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, Quentin, you're so good. Uh, I watch you every week <laughs> Thanks, and man. you're able to stay calm and keep a straight face while these people just like retell their story over and over again and, and change their tune. Like, you know, I, I wasn't really that negative and I was 100% long the whole time. So I don't know why you're questioning my, my position. <laughs> you're just never going to get any confidence from people on, you know, when you, when you watch on the, uh, on the news channels, except for Courtney, of course, who's going to like, yeah, just put blinders on. And, and, you know, and it's amazing too, when you get into next year, like we're looking at the data and it's pretty good, right? I mean, you're yeah. already starting to see housing starts. Um, you jumped big time last month or two months ago. Uh, you know, we still have a housing shortage in this country, so that should keep housing relatively strong, even with high interest rates. Automobile sales are up huge this year. No one expected that. Um, and then meanwhile, we talked about this, just the infrastructure spending that's going to happen this year. We got a presidential election year next year. Politicians are going to spend some money. 
Uh, we got that Inflation Reduction Act that's going to be promoting onshoring, uh, manufacturing of solar equipment, you name it, you know, EVs. All, there's so much that's going to go on from a manufacturing perspective. There's so much money that's going to be put into this economy over the next year that it's kind of like it's almost hard to see this economy falling off a cliff or going to this recession that everyone's talking about. Yeah, but Ryan, all the pundits saying it's going to happen eventually. Well, you know, Chris, I think that what happens is, you know, they put too much weight into what the you know political situation is, what the government does, what the Fed's doing, you know, the geopolitical unrest. I mean, just take a look at J.P. Morgan, right? We had a mini banking crisis, right? Smart people running great companies. They didn't sit back on, oh, man, what do we do? You know, let's shoot rubber bands at the screen all day. No, let's go out and take advantage of this, buy assets on sale. And then they come out and they blow their earnings out. So you always have really bright people running these companies, and, you know, they're always going to work around situations because, you know, the business of America and the business of the world is find a need and fill it. You want to be invested side by side with these smart people who are making these smart decisions because as they make money, you make money. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 127, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, Myself, Bob, Chris, and Courtney will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally will look at everything. We go as far as building you your own personalized financial portal. We're going to give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. No other financial firm will do this. We'll figure out an income plan if you're close to retirement. How do you draw from Social Security? How do you draw from your portfolio so you don't run out of money? Factoring in inflation. Inflation's at a 40-year high. How do you factor that into your portfolio? We're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been all over the place over the last couple of years as markets have been extremely volatile? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do? We're going to put together a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your money, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street just loves to sell you high-cost, tax-inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, mutual fund, brokerage product. We're going to show you how to reduce the cost on your entire portfolio and optimize it for taxes. You'll get our full tax playbook. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan if you saved over a million dollars to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob, Chris, and Courtney, you know, with our collective 75 years of wisdom, I guess we can call it wisdom at this point, you know, we found that some of the biggest problems with managing people's wealth, trying to get people ready for financial independence, is sometimes they just don't make a decision at all because there's so much information out there, it becomes paralysis by analysis. You know, you're absolutely right, Ry. It's always, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis because, you know, the I mean, biggest cause of people not having a plan, right? Remember, people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan, is paralysis by analysis. There's too many decisions to make, and you don't have to make them all at once. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Dad, and especially things like Social Security, where there's a million different ways to take it, and that's why it's so important to sit down and run through your financial plan, because you got to factor in things like longevity. Um, you know, when do you plan to retire? You know, is it better to take it early? Is it better to wait till 70? You know, there's just so many decisions to make, but, you know, actually sitting down and actually running through the numbers and looking at it from an analytical standpoint rather than an emotional standpoint is the way to go. Yeah, I think the biggest shock for most people is that, you know, the market's been going up your entire life, right? Not just your lifetime, your parents' lifetime, your grandparents' lifetime, your great-grandparents' lifetime. It's almost as if, you know, our great-grandparents didn't need a plan. They just had to accidentally spill some money into investments and we'd all be, on, you know, living off our trust funds right now. So it's, it's like there are no bad decisions. The only bad decision is not making a decision. So you always got to get started. You got to take that first step in the journey. But you said, Bob, no decision is a decision, right? So that, that is a big part of it. And I think, you know, too, it's, it's, it is a lot of questions like, you know, Court, I know with all the clients that you talk to on a daily basis, it's kind of like, how much insurance do you need? You know, do you, do you have a more aggressive portfolio? Do you need a more conservative portfolio? And it just becomes very overwhelming because there's a lot of decisions to make. And this is also something that's changing a lot throughout your lifetime. So when you're younger and you're just having kids, you need to look at things like life insurance and make sure that you have an employment insurance. There's all sorts of things you're protecting for your family. And then as you're getting later into retirement, you have a completely different set of issues where you're worried about Social Security. You're worried about estate planning. You're worried about protecting your assets if the markets go down when you're retired. 
And this is why it's important that every stage you continue to get this updated. So you don't want to just put a plan in place and then just start investing. It's something you need to also look at every single year, which, you know, every year something might not change. We still like to do it every year anyway. Um, but you'd be surprised how often these little changes will affect your finances later in life. And that's where having somebody look at it and taking the emotion out of it to Chris's point, just looking at things analytically is really helpful. So you can determine when you need to start adding in these other categories or when you need to start dialing back risk, et cetera. It's ha it'll happen slowly over time. Yeah, no, I think it's right. I mean, it's like the simple thing is, right, start the planning process first, meaning like we always talk about reverse engineering. It's like you go back and you look at what your goals are and you design everything around that. But our industry doesn't like to do that, right? We love to sell product in our industry. And as Bob likes to say, you, you have this proverbial collection of investments typically because some advisor, quote unquote, broker, has just basically sold you lots of different products for your portfolio, which has nothing to do with what you're trying to accomplish. And I think the other big thing is the internet has become, you would think we'd be, we can research things now, there's more information out there that we would make better financial decisions, but it's just not true. In fact, because there's so much information and so much bad information, I find that people actually make worse decisions now because they have more information, which is kind of crazy. You know, Rod, you're, you're absolutely right about that because you know Dr. Terrence O'Dean, from uh, University of California at Bar Berkeley, did a study on day traders, you know, back, uh, you know, when the first day traders started. And it turned out that they failed because they depended on too much information on the internet. Not that the internet, you know, had bad information. It's just that they were logical people and they thought they needed to act. They thought they needed to do a transaction every time they picked up a new bit or fact. Investing is not about being right every day. Investing is about staying invested. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of information out there on the internet, but there's not a lot of wisdom when it comes to making money long-term in the market. Well, I think a great example of that, right, we, we've just seen recently here is there's a, a thread on a, a website called Reddit, which is called Wall Street Bets. And that's what created all of these people rushing into these companies um, that were essentially really small companies that weren't necessarily doing well. And you saw people throwing money into these and the stock prices were getting extremely elevated. It was making more and more people try to get into this. And that's what you're seeing here is people are following things like a thread on the internet to get into investments and things like Bitcoins and things like these small companies. <laughs> um, it's really, you know, yes, we can have some fun money. Yes, we can gamble. I think that's okay, but it should not be our net worth. And I think that that is what people fall into the trap of, unfortunately. It's it's so that's where Ryan got his GameStop yeah. tips from. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Unfortunately, I bought the top, so I'm broke now. So I got to work a couple more years. But, but you know, Twitter's like that too. And I, what I really don't like about Twitter is not only is information bad, but the people that have the most followers and are known as like financial professionals give the worst advice. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's scary. Um, you know, these quote unquote experts online a lot of times, I think they're some of the most dangerous um, people that you could follow, these gurus, I think are one of the things that are probably the most dangerous today. And you listen, and I like to read some of this stuff once in a while, and it's just like, it's so bad, the advice. And everybody thinks these people are geniuses, and they're just leading people down a very bad place. You know, I think the other thing too, I'd mention is our industry is just, has just like full of jargon, full of fancy terms that like, you know, you can turn on the financial media, the news, and it just sounds like, whatever they're talking about is so complicated. And I think it's very, very overwhelming for anyone who's trying to get their financial independence, uh, you know, really wrap their hands around their financial independence. I think it's very overwhelming, condescending in a way that the, the terms and the jargon are just so complex. Yeah, I, I really, it, it, I think it's despicable when you, when you have an advisor who just uses that jargon, especially when they try to talk down to their clients, like, don't worry, you're a little head about it. We have it all figured out. We have it covered. We'll take care of you like they have a crystal ball. I mean, it shouldn't be that complex, right? I mean, this stuff is not rocket science. It, it should be for you. You should be able to understand what your plan is. You should be able to understand what you're invested in. It shouldn't be that complicated because if you feel overwhelmed and it feels complicated, it's probably not a very good strategy or it's probably a strategy that's not going to work that well. No, I think that's it. I think it's, uh, you know, you have to know what you own. You have to know why you own it. And it should all be based on your goals and dreams and the highest probability of achieving those uh, with the least amount of risk and volatility. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, uh, AAA estimated that 43.2 million people traveled by car over the 4th of July weekend. That's 4% above 2019. That was before the pandemic. Gas Buddy said a gallon of unleaded at gasoline averaged 
$3.49. That's 35% higher than in 2019. Gas prices are higher today. The American Farm Bureau estimated a July 4th party of 10 cheeseburgers. Pork sides dessert came in at $67.72. That's up 14% since 2019 and down 3% from last year. So still much higher than before the pandemic. Well, clearly, you know, it, we still have high inflation, but it's been trending and moderating, which has been the good news for the market this past week. But it's also very indicative. All these people traveling, all these people having barbecues, everybody's spending. And if regardless of the fact the prices are higher, very indicative of an expanding economy, not a recession, not that recession that we've been waiting for, waiting for Godot. The no-show recession is not here. The uh, consumers prove it day in and day out. Yeah, Fourth of July weekend is just more proof that uh, the consumer is uh, in very good shape right now. Chris, for sports like sprinting, which requires speed, power, and maximum oxygen consumption, athletes tend to peak in their mid-20s. Sorry, bro. Your days are over. In, in endurance sports such as marathons, the peak is typically reached around 40. And in tactical low-impact sports like sailing, hint, hint, and equestrian competition, athletes compete at elite levels in their 50s. Chris, you're not in your sailing prime yet. That's right, guys. And in, uh, in about in about eight years, I'm going to be resigning from paying capital to go sail at the Olympics. And that's true, actually. In uh, the 2016 Rio Olympics, the winner of the uh, the gold in, in multi-hull catamaran sailing was a guy named Santiago Langa. He was 55 years old when he won his first Olympic gold medal. So nice. peak when you're in your 50s. So, you know, the future is bright. I'm out of here in eight years. Just letting you know. All right, Court. Um, in the spirit of, I guess, Meta's new platform, Threads, which is like Twitter, apparently, uh, Elon Musk has said that Twitter's revenue this year would be around $3 billion. That's down from $5 billion in 2021. If Meta were to add an inc incremental $5 billion in revenue in 2024, basically the entire size of Twitter's business, it would only boost Meta's total revenue by less than 5%. I'm not sure this new threads is going to move the needle, uh, no pun intended, for Meta. It probably won't. I think probably the bigger story is that it's probably worse for Twitter than it is good for Meta, if that makes sense. But um, clearly, I mean, they have, what, over 100 million users on it in less than a week compared to what estimates are anywhere from 250 to 500 million on Twitter. But they're catching up pretty quickly. And I think people forget how easily consumers will jump from one social media platform to another. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's a reason to buy or sell the stock on it, but I think it'll be an interesting story to follow, if nothing else. Well, I know when you're on Twitter, if you send a message, it's a tweet. What, what do you call it when you're on thread? A thread? A I thread? don't know. I have no idea, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. I've, I've been, well, you're threading, you yeah. I sent you a tweet on thread. Wait a minute. That, that's on Twitter, right? I, I don't know. It's confusing. Have, have you guys tried it? I got on it, yeah. It's actually, it's, oh, uh, I don't know. It's It seems kind of fun. It's like a lot more... Uh, I don't know, positive and happy than Twitter is for some reason. Well, Courtney has a Courtney million followers, like right? Of course she's on it. No, but is it, is it, I mean, is it a negative, is it feel negative? Because I think negativity kind of sells though, right? So do you feel like it'll, do you oh, think right. it will surpass Twitter in terms of people using it? I don't know. Cause I feel like the, the, so you should download it. But basically when you get it, it's everybody you're already following on Instagram. You're just immediately following. So it's normally people that you're already interested in. And that's what, like the big argument is, is you're seeing celebrities and brands are on there and they're like responding to people a lot more than they do on Twitter. You almost have this like easier access because it's smaller right now. So people are loving that. Uh -huh. um, it's, you know, this could last a few weeks and go away, you know, who knows? But in the meantime, yeah, yeah I mean, people are, people are liking it. I don't know. I've seen like really positive things about it. All right. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. Hopefully our listeners will as well. Well, Courtney, thanks for coming today on the show. We thanks appreciate it. Great to have you and uh, another great episode. Uh, if you like this episode, love this episode, please give us a like. If this is on YouTube, you're watching this right now, you can click that subscribe button. You can click the notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. If it's on Spotify, you can subscribe to the channel. And if this is on iTunes, please give us that five-star rating. Leave us a comment. And as always, stay loose and keep an open mind.